again, I, I'm really excited that, uh, that the time may be approaching that we'll be able to reconnect uh, together again in person. We honestly don't know how soon that will be. Um, I know there's been movement uh, towards that, but we are going to be very cautious to follow uh, the counsel that our government gives us. Um, we do have a number of folks in the church who are at high risk, and we want to make sure that we are uh, loving those folks well and protecting them. So, so we'll follow the guidelines that the government sets out, but I think even within those guidelines, uh, we can see that the day is coming. In the meantime, what a blessing that God has given us the ability to be able to connect like this with one another and to enjoy God's word together and to worship together. Well, I was thinking uh, this past week about an article that I read years ago. It was written by a college professor, as a lot of strange things are. And in this article, this professor was arguing about the effects of social media on society. Now, you need to understand that this article was written uh, at a time when social media was, was at its infancy. In fact, there are versions of social media that were existing, that existed then that don't, don't exist anymore. And, and he was wrestling with an argument that was very common back then, which was how is social media going to affect the relationships that people have with one another? And this professor was making the argument that it will have no impact. And then, in fact, as people moved more and more towards being at home and staying behind their computers and interacting with one another just through their computers, it wouldn't affect the quality of people's lives. It wouldn't affect the quality of friendships whatsoever, that really the in-person contact just isn't that important uh, for our friendships. I would love to know who that professor was who wrote that. And I'm really curious to know if he still thinks that today. Because as we are restricted to social media and other forms of, of virtual connecting with one another, one of the things that I'm seeing with people online is that now that they are forced into this, they greatly appreciate and value that in-person contact. And I wonder if that's gonna be one of the ways that the folks that, that have gone through this are going to be changed coming on the other side of this, that there will be a, a, a deeper sense and deeper value for um, the importance of that in-person contact. There are other things that I'm noticing that are going on as I, as I observe people online that are similar sort of deep value changes. And maybe the biggest one that I've noticed has to do with how people are looking at their lives now and comparing it to their lives two, three months ago. And they are saying, I never want to go back to that level of busyness again. So here's my point. We spent a lot of time talking about the changes that this virus has brought into our lives through, through things like a quarantine and social distancing and um, stuff like that. But there are other changes that are going on in our lives. These are changes that are deep changes that have to do with who we are and what we value. And the reason I'm, I'm wanting us to focus on that at the start of this message is because that is a mindset that's going to be very helpful for you in understanding what Paul is doing in Romans 5, verses 12 through 21. What Paul is talking about in these verses is the dramatic change that Jesus brought into the world and into our lives. It's, it's the breadth of the change and it's the depth of the change within us. And so if you think about just the, the types of change that's going on in our lives now, those changes, even our changes in values are nothing, they are insignificant compared to the changes that, that Jesus made through the cross and through the resurrection. And that's what Paul is trying to really hit on in these verses and make the argument for. Um, so we'll look at that as we, as we go through this passage. But let me warn you that this is a very, very dense passage. There is a lot that is packed into these verses. And so we're going to need to work through them very carefully to make sure that we understand just what God is saying uh, through his word in these passages. 
And what we're going to see is that Paul's big picture argument, kind of the point of this whole section of Scripture, is that Jesus overturns the damage created by Adam. And here's how Paul is going to make that argument in these verses. He's first going to show us what was the damage that Adam brought because of his sin. And then he's going to show us how it is that Jesus overturns that, both because of how Jesus is like Adam and how Jesus is unlike Adam. Now, why is Paul talking about this here? I think there are a couple of reasons. Remember that the big picture context of where we are in Romans, Paul is defining what righteousness is. And, and he showed us last week in the first half of Romans 5 that righteousness has wrapped within it peace with God, a, a reconciled relationship with God, and that allows us to see our suffering differently, and that allows us to see our hope differently. And, and so Paul is immediately following that up with, with the issue of why can we believe that Jesus can actually pull that off? I mean, given the depth of the damage of a broken and fallen world, what could possibly make us think that Jesus can pull that off? And so Paul is going to say he can pull it off because of how he is like Adam and how he is unlike Adam. And the other thing that we need to keep in mind is that listening to this audience, originally you would have had people who were thinking that, well, wait a minute, isn't that why God gave us the law? Didn't God give us the, the, the rules for how to live and so forth so that we could overturn the damage that was created by Adam? And Paul is gonna, is gonna show us in this passage it's kind of sprinkled in throughout, but he's going to show us that there's, it's just not possible for the law to do that. That in fact, the law has the opposite effect. It makes things worse um, in some ways. So um, that becomes kind of a helpful mindset to have as well, because so often we respond to the Christian life by, by saying, well, the way that we help ourselves or the way that we help others is just to create more rules to follow. And Paul would say that was, that's never going to be the solution to uh, how to be in a healthy, growing relationship with the Lord. But well, we start in verses uh, 12 through 14, and this is where Paul shows us the, the damage done by Adam's disobedience in the Garden of Eden. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for, indeed, uh, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Okay, well, let's break down what's going on in these verses, starting with verse 12. And what verse 12 does is it sets out the progression of the damage that Adam's, uh, what we'll call a transgression, caused. Um, just as sin came into the world through Adam, so the first thing that Adam's transgression caused was the, um, the coming of sin into the world. And through that, along with sin entering the world, you had death enter into the world. And then death spread to all men because all had sinned. So here's the progression. We have Adam's transgression, and that word's important. Adam's transgression and that transgression brings sin, and coming right with sin is death, and then ultimately death spreads to all people because all are guilty of sin. Now, this distinction between transgression and sin is going to be really helpful in understanding the next two verses. A transgression is a violation of a very specific command. And so Adam's trans Adam, what Adam did in the garden was a transgression. There's a very specific command. Don't eat this fruit. Don't eat from this tree. And Adam said okay, I'll eat from the tree. That was a very specific transgression. What we're going to see is that sin has a broader meaning. Sin, sin is a, a violation of the character of God. It's a rebellion against God, and it doesn't have to have a specific command that's tied to that. So let me just anticipate verses 13 and 14 with an example. If you steal, is that wrong? Well, yeah. I mean, we can go to the Ten Commandments and say that's a transgression of one of the Ten Commandments. It's very clear. Thou shalt not steal. You stole. That's wrong. Now here's the question. Was it wrong before Moses gave the Ten Commandments? Well, I think in just 
instinctively, we kind of say, well, yeah, I mean, it's just wrong. We know that it's wrong. And that is really vital to what Paul is saying here, is that there is right and wrong that runs deeper than the rules. And that's one of the reasons the rules will never get us out of right and wrong. So let's see how what he does with that. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin was not counted where there is no law. So to understand this verse and this word counted creates a lot of confusion. We need to understand what he means. The word account, the word counted was actually a, a term in the original Greek that was applied in accounting situations. And it's by far most common use was referring to an invoice. So it was referring to a, a document where you would have spelled out very clearly what was done or, or what goods were purchased. And then very clearly what the price was associated with what was done or what goods were purchased. Purchase. So verse 13 is telling us that, that there was sin in the world, even, even though there wasn't the law to say that specifically stealing is wrong, uh, there still was sin there. And even though the law didn't say, and if you do this wrong, here's going to be the penalty. There still was right and wrong. And then Paul, uh, Paul argues for that point in verse 14. It says, yet death reigned from, Moses, from Adam to Moses. So before the, Moses gave the law, Death was there. Why is that significant? Well, death is the penalty of sin. So Paul is saying, look, we know there was sin that had to be held accountable for because death was holding people accountable even before Moses gave the law. And even though they were sinning, uh, their sin was not like the transgression of Adam. Adam had a very clear command that he disobeyed. And even though the people from Adam to Moses didn't have the clear commands there still was the accountability of death that was held over them because of uh, the fact that their sin was in the world. So just one or two more things to clarify. When we talk about death, what is Paul talking about here? It's not just physical death, but it is physical death. But on top of that, it's also spiritual death. It's, it's saying that, um, that we are separated from God and there is no greater death that we can experience in being separated from God. And so Paul is saying that, that death, both physical and spiritual, reigned from Adam until Moses, and that tells you uh, that there is a deeper right or wrong than just what's in the law. So this chart, I, I found this to be really helpful in thinking through and putting together these verses. So here's the progression that Paul is talking about in these verses. In the Garden of Eden, Adam disobeyed, and we call that a transgression because it was a direct disobedience to a very specific command. With that transgression, sin enters the world, and right with sin coming just along in, a, in sin's backpack is death as the, as the penalty, the price that comes with sin. Later, Moses gives the law. And what the law does is it specifically accounts for, it invoices, this is what is wrong, and here's the penalty for it. And so the question is, what happens between here and here? And Paul is making the point, well, everyone was still, people still died. And therefore, people still had something that they needed to be held accountable for. Why is Paul making this argument? Well, there are two things. One is he wants to show the magnitude of what Adam did. But here's the other thing. He wants to make sure that we understand the magnitude to be more than we are people who break the rules. He wants us to understand that there is something far deeper going on, that it didn't take the rules to make us people who were deeply broken inside. And that is important because if you think that all that is wrong is that people break the rules, then you will think the solution is to get people to keep the rules. And we will either guilt people, manipulate people, or create more and new rules for people to keep to try to get them fixed. And Paul is shooting down that idea right up front. That was never the problem, and just creating more rules is never going to be the solution. So think about the massive power of Adam's transgression. This one act had implications for every person in all of human history. 
And the other thing that is, is interesting is he essentially rewrote our spiritual DNA. See, everyone after him faces physical and spiritual death. Our brokenness is so deep that as soon as God gave the law, our first response was to say, that's great. I now understand what's right and what's wrong very clearly, and I understand the price. Let's go break the law. And you know what? We still do that today. And everyone in all of human history still does the same thing. And sadly, so often we in our churches still respond to that truth in exactly the wrong way. We still think that the, that the answer is just to create more rules and impose them on people. Anyone here ever been to a high school youth camp? And I'm not necessarily talking about FBCs because um, I don't know that that's true of FBC, but let me tell you about the high school youth camp that I visited one time when I was in high school. We spent the um, first 45 minutes of the camp having officially launched, sitting in a large room with a man in front with a three-page document. And he took 30 to 45 minutes going through that document, explaining all of the rules of the camp. We did not get through that list. We did not make it through the 30 to 45 minutes before multiple rules were violated. But that is so our inclination, is we think the solution is just to impose more burdens and restrictions on ourselves and try to, to contain or constrain our behavior. But that's not what we need. We don't need new rules. We need a new heart. We need to be made new. And that is exactly where Paul is going in this passage. That is what Jesus does. That's part of the power of what Jesus does as someone who's both like and dislike Adam. And he actually starts that at the end of verse 14. But to understand what's going on at the end of verse 14, you need to understand a quarter. Here's what I mean. Whose picture or who is on the quarter? Give you a few seconds to ponder that and answer. Presumably, you came up with George Washington, which would make sense. But let's stop and think. Is George Washington on the quarter? No. George Washington is dead. There's an image of George Washington on the quarter. And it looks like George Washington in some ways. In some ways, obviously, it doesn't look like George Washington. George Washington wasn't just a head. Um, but yeah, you can look at that quarter and say, when I look at that image, I know that I'm supposed to think of George Washington and it successfully gets me to think of George Washington, even though it's both like George Washington and unlike George Washington. Why are we talking about quarters? Because when we get to the end of verse 14, Paul says that Adam was a type of the one who was to come. The Greek word that's translated type, guess what that word was used for? It was used for the image or an imprint that was on a coin. And so it was really common in the New Testament. You'll find this in, in a few different places where New Testament writers will look back at the Old Testament and say, this person in the Old Testament was a type of Christ in some way. And what they're wanting us to think of is exactly what that original audience would have thought of. It was like the image on a coin that is in many ways not like Christ, but in some very, very important ways, when you look at that image, you see that there is a reflection of who Christ is or what Christ has done. That's what Paul is wanting to do here. He's going to show us that Jesus was able to overturn the damage caused by Adam because of how Jesus was both similar to Adam and how he was different from Adam. And he's actually gonna start with how Jesus is different from Adam. Excuse me, and the focus is gonna be on how much greater Jesus is than Adam. And you're gonna actually see that in the repetition of these words much more. You'll see it here in verse 15 and verse 17 as well. But the free gift is not like the, trans it's not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more, 
have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So again, Paul is arguing that Jesus is greater than Adam, and he's going to show us that through this much more. In verse 15, he's showing us that the free gift of Jesus is much more than Adam's transgression. Adam's transgression brought death. Many died. But Jesus, Jesus' gift uh, brought grace, and uh, that grace also is a free gift. And we know that that free gift was, was exactly what Paul was talking about last week. It's, it's the restored relationship with God. It's peace with God. So Adam's transgression brought death. Jesus brought grace and the free gift of peace with God. And so Paul's point here is that, look, we are certain that Adam's, that Adam's transgression brought sin and death because we experience it every single day. How much more certain is it that Jesus' death and resurrection brought grace and life? He continues with the much more. This time it's going to be down in verse 17, but verse 16 kind of builds us into verse 17. Verse 16 is showing us uh, the result of what Jesus brought versus what Adam brought. The free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. What did that one man's sin bring? It brought judgment following the trespass, and that brought condemnation. But what did the free gift bring? It brought justification. So here's what he's saying in verse 16. He is saying that what Adam brought us through his transgression was a guilty verdict before the Lord. Everyone stands guilty. But what Jesus brought was justification, which is the verdict of not guilty. And so so both are able to bring a a verdict, but Jesus is far greater. And if because of the one man's trespass, death reigned, so now he's going to talk about authority through the one man. Well, those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus. So, so Adam brings an authority into people's lives. And we're going to see this come up again in the next section. And that authority is death. But Jesus brings an authority, and it's a very different authority. The authority that Jesus brings is, an, is the authority of grace and the free gift of righteousness that reign in life. So let me say this a different way, and I, and I will keep using this analogy. Adam's transgression rewrote our spiritual DNA. Adam's transgression caused us to be people who were under the authority of death and who lived uh, at the mercy of sin and death. But Jesus' gift rewrote that DNA one more time, and he is the final editor. So what are the implications of this for us? Well, the implications, first off, are that... um, because Jesus is greater than Adam, the verdict that he is able to bring overrules Adam's verdict. What Adam brought was a verdict of guilty. Jesus brings the verdict of not guilty. And so we need to stop believing the lies that we tell ourselves or that we hear from Satan, which is that, that God is condemning you or, or the lie that, that your verdict is in doubt and it depends on how well you keep the rules. Because what Paul is saying is that the verdict is not in doubt. The verdict is if you are a follower of Christ, if you are in relationship with Christ, then you are not guilty and there is no retrial. The second thing is because Jesus is greater than Adam, your spiritual DNA has been rewritten. He is making you new. Your eternal future is a future of life, not death. And your present reality is abundant life. And not abundant life the way the world defines it as as, um, wealth and power and fame or things like that. But but as God defines it, an abundant life is a life lived in relationship with God, growing closer to him. See, Adam launched a tidal wave. And that tidal wave crashed through human history, bringing destruction and death. And Paul shows how Jesus and Adam are different. What they brought was different. Transgression versus the gift of grace. The results were different. Death and condemnation versus life and redemption. And now Paul is going to shift gears to showing how Adam and Jesus are similar. And he's going to use a series of what are called uh, as-so statements. 
And we're going to see again, even as he's showing that they're similar, that Jesus is greater than Adam. And his point is that because of how Jesus and Adam are similar, Jesus can overturn the damage that Adam caused. The first of these as those as so statements are in, is in verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. The first similarity is that it only took one act to impact all humanity. Adam's one act led to condemnation, a guilty verdict. Jesus' one act led to righteousness or his, his righteousness led to justification and life for all men. That's a not guilty verdict. So two very, very different verdicts. But Paul is saying for each of them, it only took one act. Now, we need to remember here what Paul is talking about when he says all men. Uh, because we know that Paul has already established that we don't benefit from Jesus' death and resurrection unless we have faith in him unless we believe that Jesus is who he said he is, and that is the son of God, and that he did what he said he would do, that he lived a perfect life, died on the cross, paid the price for our sins, and was raised three days later so that we might have new life in Christ uh, and with God. And so he's not saying that everyone is automatically justified. He is saying that that justification is available to everyone and all that is required is that we believe. Well, that's the first as so, the, the, or the first similarity. The next thing is that Adam is like Jesus in, um, in a way that's gonna look like he's repeating himself, but it's subtly, subtly different. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. First thing I'll notice is really just one of, of emphasis as to how this is different from verse 18. This is not a major thing, but I think he's talking more about the people here, even though he speaks of the obedience and disobedience. Um, he's, he's very much talking about the people as opposed to their act. But, but here's what is the, the bigger difference, and it's in how they impact people. It's not just the verdict. It's what those people were turned into. Both of them are similar, Adam and Jesus, because who they are and what they did, their disobedience or their obedience, had the ability to fundamentally change who we are. And Adam fundamentally turned us into sinners. And Jesus fundamentally made us righteous. Once again, this is the spiritual DNA that's popping up. They both had the ability to change our spiritual DNA. As sinners, our spiritual DNA is that we are inclined to sin. In fact, that inclination is so strong that we are definitely going to sin. And, and even worse than that, because we are sinners, we are automatically separated from God. But that changes with Jesus. DNA, by saying that, that we are made righteous, he's not saying that we're just everything we do is automatically right. He is saying that when God looks at us, if we're in relationship with Christ, when God looks at us, what he sees is the righteousness of Jesus. And then God goes to work at making us in our thoughts and our actions and our values and our relationships and our purpose in life, making us to actually be the way that he sees us, which is like Jesus. So that's the second way that Adam and Jesus were like. They have the ability to impact all of humanity and to change DNA uh, through who they are and what they do. And then the third and final one is in verses 20 and 21. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And there's the implied so there. Um, what is Paul doing here? Well, Verses 20 is really um, setting up that there is a difference in authority um, that we already saw, but that both have the ability, both Adam and Jesus have the ability to set authorities over our lives. The law came, and what did the law do? It actually increased the trespass. Now, why did the law increase the trespass? Remember, we didn't have the invoice before, so we didn't have the list of what was right and what was wrong. Once we got the list, we started breaking the rules. Uh, 
but this is the incredible promise. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That's the amazing reassurance that, that we have here, is that it doesn't matter how bad or how much we struggle and we blow it, Paul is saying God's grace abounds more and more. And so he goes from there into the as so statement. That is, as sin raised, reigned in death, and this is actually the so, grace might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life. So what is he saying there? Again, both of them have the ability to put something on the throne. What Adam put on the throne through his disobedience was death and sin. What Jesus puts on the throne is grace that leads to eternal life, that leads to life both now that is abundant and life that is forever in relationship with God. Adam left us under the power and authority of sin. Jesus moves us under the power and authority of grace, and that leads to life. So how is it that Jesus and Adam are alike? Well, they both set off tidal waves, and those tidal waves both crash through all of human history. Adam's tidal wave led to guilt. It wired us to be sinners, and it led, us, it led to the reign of sin and death over us. Jesus' tidal wave is very, very different. It led us to a not guilty verdict. It was able to rewire us, but it rewires us in such a way that we are declared righteous by God and we are being made righteous. And it led to the reign of grace and life. We have just done a careful look at the forest of this passage and just tried to understand what God is saying. And again, the point is, that Jesus is able to overturn everything that Adam has done. But we need to take our eyes off the, the, the trees of the forest and move back and look at the forest itself. And what we need to see is that what Adam is describing in these verses is God's mission. This is what God is doing. Adam brought damage, and God's on mission to undo that damage, which really that mission started before Christ. It's something that goes all the way back from the very beginning into the Garden of Eden, but it begins before Christ, but it culminates in Christ and has continued since then. This is God's mission in history. And why do I want us to make sure that we don't miss the forest? Because we tend to get this backwards. We tend to think that overturning the damage caused by Adam is our mission and that we invite God to support us and join us in our mission. And Paul would say that is backwards. This is God's mission. And because it is God's mission, it is a mission that is going to succeed. It is a mission that is going to work itself out in our lives culminating in eternity. And it is a mission that God invites us to participate in and gives us the grace and blessing to participate in. It's not the other way around. So for us, we respond to a passage like this by saying, this is what God is doing. How is it that I can participate in what God is doing given the restrictions that we are under today? Well, I think there are two fundamental things that we can do, and really they're the fundamental things that we should do even without a quarantine. And, and I have it second here, but really the first and foundational is, is to pray. Um, part of how we need to pray is for God to open our eyes to how he is overturning the effects of uh, the damage that Adam has created. But also we need to be praying for people around us. I'll come back to that in a second. The other thing we need to do is we need to be having conversations with people because we can do that uh, through texting or email or online. And, and we can have conversations about spiritual things, about God with people that relate directly to this passage. We can talk about, as we saw last week, that there are fears and insecurities and discontentments in our lives. But this adds to today's passage adds to that by saying that God is overturning those things. So we can talk to one another, and we can talk to those who don't know the Lord about 
you know, this is something that I was afraid of at the start of the quarantine, but I'm finding greater peace about this. Well, why are you finding greater peace? It's not just because the stores are stocked with toilet paper again. It's because God is replacing fear with peace. He is overturning the damage that was created by Adam. You can talk to people about how God is overturning a sinful part of your life. One of the things that I know I'm discovering, and I suppose uh, many of us are discovering as we are in quarantine, is is maybe the depth of our self-centeredness. Um, I've, I've known I'm a self-centered person for a long time, and I find that more and more as I'm in this situation, I discover uh, new layers of the onion of how my self-centeredness shows up. And... We don't like to talk about our struggles with people, but I think it is actually really powerful, especially with people who don't know the Lord, to be able to say, this is how I struggle. Um, this is how I was blowing it in life. And God is overturning that power. He's, he's, he's overturning that in my life. Another suggestion is have conversations about how you are different now that grace and not sin reigns in your life. How do you treat people differently that you're operating by grace and not by, um, not by sin and by rule keeping. And then the reason I put prayer after this is because as we are having conversations with people about God, we need to have conversations with God about people. Uh, that's a phrase I heard a long time ago and I think it's a really good one. Uh, we need to have these conversations with people and then let's turn around and go to the Lord and say, here's the person I talked to today. Uh, would you work in their heart? We have um, an extraordinary Savior. This is what Paul wants us to see. We have an extraordinary Savior that has the ability to overturn all of the damage that was created by Adam. And that is the point. But there is a greater implication to this point that we need to keep in mind. And that is that we need to not be overcome by what Jesus has overturned. Don't be overcome by the fears or insecurities or discontentments. Don't be overcome by um, selfishness or self-centeredness that so often comes in situations like this. Jesus is overturning those things. Don't be overwhelmed or overcome by um, the anxiety. Jesus is overturning all of the damage that was created by Adam. And don't be overcome by hopelessness as you talk to people about God. Um, Jesus is in the business of overturning all of the damage caused by Adam. And even those people who seem so resistant to the Lord as you talk to them, Jesus is in the business of overturning all of the damage caused by Adam. Just some couple other ways that you can respond to this passage. Again, I'm encouraging you uh, to rewrite Romans 5, uh, 12 through 21 in your own words. And I want to remind you to have conversations. This, there's so little that we can do, but this is something we can do in connecting with one another. And then just continue to ask the Lord to build your trust that he is overturning a broken world. He's overturning a broken world that's affected by a virus. He's overturning a broken world that is affected by sin that is keeping your loved ones um, far from God. And Jesus will overturn them. I want to uh, close in prayer. And as we close in prayer, let's go before the Lord and remember and give thanks for the fact that he is on a mission of overturning a broken world. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you for your care for us. Thank you that you love us and watch out over us. And Lord, thank you that it is your mission that you are overturning the damage that was done by Adam. You are overturning the damage that is done by a broken and fallen world. And Lord, we thank you that you invite us to participate in your mission. And we ask, Lord, that you would help us to join in that well and join in that even with the limits that we face with quarantine. We thank you that you forgive us when we fail to join in the mission we thank you that you forgive us when we fail to uh, truly trust that Jesus did overturn the damage created by Adam. 
And Lord, we ask that you help us to live more in light of those truths this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me just remind you uh, before we shut down what it is that we've said about God. God has a mission, and that mission is to overturn the damage that was created by Adam. And that is a mission that is going to succeed. So what is our charge as we wrap up? Our charge is to participate in that mission. And an extremely practical way you can do that is to take some of the ideas that uh, I suggested for conversation starters or ways to season the conversation and, um, and engage with those around you, especially non-Christians, with how you see the effects of God overturning the damage that Adam has done. I hope you have a wonderful week. Uh, I know we're going to keep the, um, uh, the online service on for a little bit, so if you need prayer or if you need to respond to the Lord by saying, hey, I want to be in relationship with him, you can do that through this website and we will engage with you and, um, and help you out in any way that we can. I hope you have a wonderful week. Please stay safe and I uh, look forward to connecting with you again very soon.